Hey, 42 here. Human beings are unique in the animal kingdom in many different ways. We have opposable thumbs, which we evolved to play Xbox and operate complex TV remotes. And our disproportionately large brains have allowed us to do incredible things like send people to the moon and invent Fortnite. But perhaps the most striking difference between human beings and our animal cousins is the way we've been able to take control of the world around us. We've harnessed natural resources to power our homes and chopped down trees to make room for the cities that contain them. We've dug deep beneath the earth in search of precious metals and gemstones. And we domesticated plants to feed our ever-growing numbers. But it isn't just earth that we've shaped to suit our needs. The same goes for other animals too. Since the first time ancient man forcibly parted a proto-chicken from its unborn child to make his scrambled eggs, We've happily exploited Earth's other tenants for food, warmth, labour, entertainment, companionship, and medical research. We've even roped them into our wars. And I don't just mean cavalry chargers and carrier pigeons. Being the endlessly inventive and occasionally sadistic species that we are, we forced animals to fight for us in ways that are both fascinating and horrifying in equal measure, including bombs made of bats, pigeon pilots, and explosive rats. But before we get into the ridiculous, perhaps we'd better start with the equine. Now, I'm a major proponent of preserving traditional customs, skills, and crafts. Kamikoto knives are beautiful tools, made with high-quality Japanese steel using traditional techniques. Each knife is individually inspected and comes with a lifetime guarantee. The knives come in this absolutely stunning heavy duty ash wood box. And you know, with Christmas just around the corner, this makes the ideal present. Kamikoto knives are the real deal and are used by Michelin star chefs all over the world. Using Kamikoto knives has made my meal prep both a breeze and a really enjoyable task. It's just such a pleasure using a beautiful tool and a really sharp knife. These Japanese steel knives are razor sharp and make quick work of whatever you're chopping. I've been loving using them and they're now the first thing I reach for whenever I'm in the kitchen. Kamikoto is running a massive Black Friday sale right now and offering my viewers an extra 50 US dollars off any purchase with discount code 42. Go to kamikoto.com 42 and help support the channel. Thanks to Kamikoto for sponsoring this video. Arguably the best known animal associated with warfare is the horse, thought to have been used as far back as 4000 BC. In the 6,000 years since, we've used horses to carry us into battle, transport our equipment, speed up communications, and, in a pinch, fill our bellies. Horses helped Genghis Khan conquer half the world in the 13th century, and they were still being used by the Polish army to fight off the Nazis in 1939. Although, admittedly, that didn't go too well. Still, it's no exaggeration to say that an armed man on horseback was the most devastating weapon in existence for several millennia at least, with horses only being phased out during the Second World War when tanks made them obsolete. Do you think our trusty war horses were upset by that turn of events? Nay. Elephants were also used as cavalry in ancient warfare, first in India around the 6th century BC. Their main function was to charge and break enemy lines, sowing panic and fear along the way. As you can probably imagine, they were incredibly effective. A large unit of war elephants was practically invincible. Unless you happen to know their one fatal weakness, their Achilles trunk. A counter weapon that once deployed will cause even the bravest war elephant to drop 18 kilograms of excrement and run for the hills. Any ideas what that secret weapon might have been? If you guessed war pig, then one, you must have some highly unusual reading habits, and two, I'm impressed. As odd as it may sound, pigs positively petrified elephants, rendering them essentially useless. Still, that seems to have been a fairly well-kept secret because elephants were still being used as recently as 1987 by the Iraqi military. Dogs have been employed during times of war for hundreds of years to deliver messages, take part in patrols, and even carry slippers, sorry, supplies to the wounded. Over 50,000 dogs were used in World War I alone, thousands of which ended up going to the Great Kennel in the Sky. 
But we've also conscripted our canine companions in some more creative and ultimately disastrous ways. One of the most brutal doggy duties dreamt up by the Soviets during the Second World War was the anti-tank dog. As the name suggests, anti-tank dogs were trained to drop timed explosives underneath German tanks before scampering to safety to admire the fireworks. Simple though the idea was, carrying it out in the theatre of war was another matter entirely. For one thing, the dogs were often confused by wartime conditions and would run back to their handlers, bombs in tow, with predictably disastrous consequences. The original plan having failed spectacularly, the Soviets came up with a new one, to use the dogs as unwitting kamikaze fighters, armed with explosives that would detonate as soon as they were released, killing the dog and whatever happens to be nearby. If this is how man treats his best friends, I'd hate to see what we do to our worst enemies. Still, the dogs had the last laugh, kind of. They'd naturally been trained on Soviet tanks, but unlike the petrol guzzling tanks used by the Germans, the Soviet models ran on diesel. In the heat and confusion of battle, the dogs relied on their sense of smell to navigate, and more often than not, they headed straight for the comforting, familiar smell of Soviet diesel. Nobody's quite sure exactly how many tanks were destroyed by Soviet anti-tank dogs, friendly or otherwise, but the programme was quietly mothballed in 1943, after many mortifying mishaps. Like most Americans, dentist Little Adams was incensed by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbour, and he spent much of his spare time dreaming up ways the USA could wreak her revenge. Unlike most Americans, though, Little had a direct connection to the White House via Eleanor Roosevelt, the First Lady, which is how he managed to get a letter through to the President of the United States, which contained an audacious plan that must have been just crazy enough to get the President's backing, because it initiated one of the most bizarre projects of the entire war. This confounding contraption is a bat bomb. A 1.5 meter long bomb containing 1,040 compartments, each holding a tiny amount of napalm and something far scarier. A small but mighty Mexican free-tailed bat. The idea was that the bomb would be dropped from a plane, shedding its casing when a parachute control descent began at a height of 1,200 meters. Having served their time in bat purgatory, the furry inmates would suddenly find themselves free to go wherever they pleased, taking their tiny napalm payloads with them. As far as weapons go, the bat bomb was, fittingly, batshit insane. But it was also kind of ingenious. Japanese houses are traditionally built of highly combustible materials like wood and paper, so fire was a major threat. And whilst regular incendiary bombs could have been used instead, the bat bomb was far more devastating. The bat's payloads were on timers, and once they went off, they'd set fire to whatever was nearby. By that point, the bats would have spread out over the entire city, and many of them would be happily roosting in hard to reach but highly flammable hiding places, like the roofs of old buildings. By the time anyone realized what was going on, there would be hundreds of fires raging all over the city. Unlike the anti-tank dog disaster, the bat bomb genuinely worked, a fact that was proven spectacularly when one was accidentally set off in the middle of Carlsbad Army Airfield in New Mexico during testing. Bats armed with napalm were soon flying around all over the place, setting fires and roosting in the most awkward, hard to reach places, including underneath a fully loaded fuel tank. Yeah. The ensuing explosion destroyed the entire testing area. Subsequent, slightly more controlled tests showed the bat bomb to be incredibly effective, and the ingenious weapon may well have seen active service had the program been completed just a little bit earlier. In the end, though, the bat bomb wasn't declared ready for action until 1945, by which point the Americans had invented a different kind of bomb, of the atomic variety. When a single doomsday device can level an entire city in one explosion, painstakingly gluing tiny parcels of napalm to a thousand Mexican bats 
suddenly felt like a waste of time. Another American citizen keen to lend a hand to the war effort was renowned behavioral psychologist, inventor, and patriot, Burra Skinner, who, in 1943, aimed to solve the problem of missiles missing their targets. At the time, electronic guidance was in its infancy, and therefore both unreliable and expensive. And that's where Project Pigeon came in. Skinner had experienced training pigeons in his psychological research, and he had a hunch that they'd be surprisingly well suited to war. Not only do pigeons have good eyesight, but they remain remarkably unflappable, even in the most tumultuous of circumstances, as anyone who's tried to shoo a pigeon away from their sandwich in the park will already know. Skinner planned to make use of these admiral attributes by training our feathered friends as pilots. He designed a specially fitted missile nose cone with a tiny cockpit, big enough to house up to three pigeons, each of which would be positioned in front of a live video feed of whatever target needed blowing up. The pigeons had been conditioned to peck whichever part of the screen contains the target in return for a few seeds. Depending on where they pecked, cables attached to their heads would feed information back to the flight control system, which would make the necessary adjustments automatically if the missile started to go off course. Sadly, the projectiles weren't fitted with ejector seats, so a pigeon pilot's first mission would also be its last. The first demonstration of the guidance system was successful, but the program was terminated in October 1944, as all focus moved to the Manhattan Project. And though it was briefly resurrected after the war, improvements in electronic guidance systems eventually saw the idea shelved for good. Had pigeon kind shared a collective consciousness, there surely would have been a giant coup of relief. Americans' ingenuity and inventiveness in building bat bombs and pigeon-guided missiles was really impressive. But they weren't the only ones blowing up animals in the name of military progress. The British also got in on the act, though true to form, their attempts weren't quite so grand as those across the pond. The Brits, specifically the British Special Operations Executive, made all manner of ingenious devices during the Second World War. But if you're picturing Q handing 007 an elegantly understated gerbil watch, you might be disappointed. Whilst the Americans developed their blazing bat bombs and put their pigeon pilots through their paces, we Brits were busy coming up with exploding rats. Allow me to explain this highly intricate device. Take a dead rat, slice it open, and fill its lifeless carcass with plastic explosives then sew it back up. Voila, you've just made your very own exploding rat. Time to take over the world. Okay, so the point of the exploding rat might not be all that obvious at first. The fact it's already dead means you still need a person to take it to the place you want to blow up, at which point you could just do away with the rat carcass entirely. But here's where the clever bit comes in. The explosive rats were intended to be left in and around factories and other key production facilities, specifically those with large industrial furnaces. Dead rats are a fairly common sight in those kinds of places, and when found, they're disposed of. But you can't just dump a dead animal in the dustbin and forget about it, not if you have a sense of smell. It's much better to deal with the problem once and for all by shoveling the carcass into a furnace. With a normal dead rat, that'd be fine, but if your rigor mortis rodent happens to contain several grams of plastic explosive, well, there goes your factory. The idea was genius in its simplicity, and it had some success, though not as intended. The very first batch of stinky and rather dangerous rodents was intercepted by the Nazis before its occupants could reach their destinations. As a result, not one single furry death bomb was ever thrown into a furnace. But the discovery of a crate full of exploding rats was enough to set Nazi High Command into meltdown, as they imagined God knows how many non-intercepted containers making their way across the Third Reich. A colossal rat hunt ensued, and so much time and money was spent searching for exploding rats that the operation was deemed a resounding success. 
Since the Second World War, animals in warfare have come along in leaps and bounds. Today, there are rumours of programmes using dolphins, seals, and even spy sharks. But regardless of how sophisticated these weapons become, they still rely on innocent creatures being forcibly conscripted into the unfortunate task of fighting our wars for us. It doesn't seem fair, really. Someone should call the military wing of the RSPCA. Thanks for watching.